The population of Ireland reached a peak around 1841, a level it has still to match. Famine and mass emigration led to a rapid fall from 1845 onwards. The 1841 census showed that there were almost 8.2 million people living in the four provinces of Connacht, Leinster, Munster, and Ulster. Only 40 years later at the 1881 census, this figure had fallen by over 3 million to just over 5 million. This equated to 37% fewer people than there had been. This figure, however continued to fall to a recorded historical low of 4.2 million, for the whole island by 1926. The famine had a far-reaching effect on Ireland's population. Through the 1830s and 1840s, the rural population of Ireland had become very dependent on the potato as a staple part of the diet. Over-dependent in fact. The price to pay for this dependence was the famine of which became known as Black 47. The famine was partly caused by potato blight, which was caused by a fungus. This fungus was not new at this time, it had caused the loss of crops before the 1840s with some regularity. In 1830-31 particularly bad outbreaks of potato blight had led to localized hardships in some parts of Ireland, and reduced a good many families to begging to stay alive. What was particularly bad and ultimately tragic about the outbreak was that it wasn't simply one poor season for potatoes but a series of poor seasons that had begun in 1845 when a third to a half of the potato harvest was lost, this was followed by an almost total loss of the potato crop, in 1846. The potatoes grown in Ireland at the time and eaten by the poor were almost exclusively a variety called the Irish lumper, it was particularly susceptible to potato blight. Potatoes were the staple diet in rural Ireland and provided 60% of Irish food needs. Hence, the famine killed nearly one-eighth of the entire population due to starvation and the epidemic disease that resulted from it. Another, and more significant factor as to why the famine was particularly devastating, was that of the inactions, and actions of the Whigs liberals, of the British government in London, led by Lord John Russell, were severely worsening the famine. The general view in Westminster was that the Irish were not worth their effort and the famine was the fault of the Irish. Rather than treating the famine as an imperial responsibility they thrust the responsibility to Ireland despite them having inadequate resources and infrastructure to deal with the problems on hand. For example, England alone had over six and a half thousand miles of railway while Ireland only had little over 150 miles of track. With food prices rising, the British government did not increase workers' wages. The Irish people found it increasingly difficult to afford food. They even imposed tariffs on food, meaning it would be more expensive. The government decreed that no surplus food was to be given to the starving, as not to disturb the food industry. Whilst the British government established a soup kitchen in March of 1847, they quickly discontinued this by that September, because they believed the food shortage would end within the year. Therefore, they only implemented temporary relief measures. The soup kitchen was feeding 3 million people daily, but the British government thought that running it wasn't worth the effort. The British implementation of free trade meant that all Irish crops were sold, leaving the farmer nothing to eat. The crippled economy and free trade meant farmers had no money to pay rent. British Foreign Minister, Lord Palmerston, instantly evicted all farmers who were unable to pay. Absentee landlords were common in Ireland and for many of them, the primary focus was income rather than the conditions of their tenants. Many of these landowners realized that they could get a higher income by turning their properties to pasture rather than to continue with the old practice of collecting rents from tenant farmers. Eviction was the most common way of getting rid of unwanted tenants. <laughs>
the tenant frequently built their cottage themselves, from local materials. However, their rent was higher if they had windows, if their door was over a certain height, or if they made any type of improvements or enlargements to the dwelling. Landlords practiced what was known as rack renting, in order to get rid of tenants. Rents were raised to the point that the tenant could not afford to pay them. But they then had the tenant evicted for non-payment of rent. There were no appeals and no mercy shown. Although the only legal reason for eviction was non-payment of the rent there were numerous examples of landlords who evicted tenants if they did not conform to their wishes. A particularly tragic aspect of the famine was that despite the failure of the main crop that should have provided the staple diet for over a third of the population, generally the poorest third, Ireland did successfully produce a good crop of grain in 1847. This grain, however, was owned in the main by absent landlords and was exported for cash while many of Ireland's own people were starving. Despite the over-reliance on potatoes, grain was unaffected by the potato blight and this could have averted the worst effects of the famine, had this grain been used at home to feed the people. The poor were often reduced to looking through the ravaged potato fields for any potatoes that had escaped the disease. Ireland and her people were neglected by the central government in Westminster. Irish racism in Victorian Britain included the stereotyping of the Irish as violent and alcoholic. Some English illustrators depicted a prehistoric ape-like image of Irish faces to bolster evolutionary racist claims that the Irish people were an inferior race as compared to Anglo-Saxons. Similar to other immigrant populations, they were sometimes accused of cronyism and subjected to misrepresentations of their religious and cultural beliefs. Irish Catholics were particularly singled out for attack by Protestants. In Liverpool, England, where many Irish immigrants settled following the Great Famine, anti-Irish prejudice was widespread. The sheer numbers of people coming across the Irish Sea and settling in the poorer districts of the city led to physical attacks and it became common practice for those with Irish accents or even Irish names to be barred from jobs, public houses and employment opportunities. There were even signs in the pub saying, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. There were also Nina signs, reading, help wanted, no Irish need apply. In 1836, young Benjamin Disraeli wrote, The Irish, hate our order, our civilization, our enterprising industry, our pure religion. This wild, reckless, indolent, uncertain and superstitious race have no sympathy with the English character. Their ideal of human felicity is an alternation of clannish broils and coarse idolatry. Their history describes an unbroken circle of bigotry and blood. Desperate as the months went on, and for those who could, emigration was their only hope. Emigration had always been an aspect of Irish life, but the famine hastened the flow enormously. The option of leaving one's country was not an easy way out by any means. As well as the usual worries and problems of leaving home, and going to a new foreign country. There were additional difficulties of a lack of funds to pay for the trip and also a lack of money for provisions. The fares were around 55 shillings to Canada, and 70 to 100 shillings to the USA. 20 shillings equaled one pound. Travel on board the ship was either in standard class or steerage. Standard class included berths and the passengers could walk on the decks, small though they were. Steerage passengers were treated more like livestock. They were crowded together below decks, often not being allowed to use the deck. For the majority of emigrants, steerage was the most they could afford. Many people who left Ireland by ship for the United States in particular never arrived, dying of starvation or related disease en route. Disease that was made worse by the cramped and unsanitary conditions on the ships. Some of the ships that left Ireland during these famine years were known as coffin ships for good reason. On some ships up to 40% of passengers died during the voyage or shortly after arrival. 
Overall about 1 in 7 did not survive the crossing. Before the famine, the rate of emigration in 1845 was at around 50,000 per year. The next year 1846 as the famine started to hit hard 100,000 left. The peak was in 1847, the hardest famine year when 250,000 left. It continued at an average of around 200,000 per year for the next five years, before beginning to fall again. Little over 150 years after the famine, Ireland's population has still not recovered. In 1845 there were over 8 million people on the island. As of January 2018, the population of Ireland was just under 5 million people. My young love said to me, my mother won't mind, and my father won't spite you for your lack of kind. And she stepped away from me, and this she did say. It will not be 